come to an end, I think, to our study of James. We've been going through the book of James, and this will be the 12th sermon we've had on James. And James ends it, as he did to all throughout the book, on a powerful note. The whole book of James, and, and next week, this morning when I was praying, God may be speaking to me on kind of doing a recap of James next week. I don't know. But I just want to let you know that another thing that God's laid in my heart, we're going to be doing a series, I don't know how long it's going to be, not probably too long, but on heaven. What the Bible says about heaven. Not what the Hollywood says, not what people that had claimed to have been in heaven. I know we've all seen the movies and all the stuff, but what does the Bible say about heaven? You know, that's really what's important, really, right? I mean, what does the Word of God say about heaven? So, uh, we're going to be doing that. I don't know when we're starting that. I'm just telling you what's it, what's coming up in the future. But uh, looking forward to that. I thought it was going to be next week, but it may not be, so we'll see. Uh, also, today, James gives us a series of tests all throughout the book of James. We, we, we see a series of tests that we're, we go through. And in order to help us to mature in our walk with Jesus, and I, I just want to say this, that I don't want James to end because James came to me at a critical time in my life, in my walk with Jesus. And this, this scripture, as I studied and meditated on James, I don't think I've ever been impacted as much on a book of the Bible as I have James in my personal walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope it's did the same for you. That's why I may recap it next week, because I really don't want it to end. But one of the ways we grow up is through adversity. How many understand that we get stronger, even though it's tough, adversity strengthens us. He allows it in our lives, and he looks to see how we're going to respond to it. Just like when you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Okay, when you get squeezed, when you get squeezed, what's inside will come out. The lemon is going to, the lemon juice is going to come out because that's inside the lemon. And what's inside of you when you're squeezed is, is what's going to come out. The question is, how do I make it when times are tough? How many are going through some tough times right now? How do I make it when times are tough and the world is falling apart all around me and I'm trying to live for Jesus? James teaches us in James 5, when tribulation come, and they will, they will come, we need to pray. Prayer is probably the most misunderstood, most neglected part of the Christian life for all of us, if you, if you get really serious. I told you last week, if I ask you how's your prayer life, I guarantee that will humble you. I know it will humble me. How is your prayer life? If you want to read the thermometer of your life, look at the thermostat and see what, where your prayer life is. Because your prayer life is going to dictate a lot of things that go on in your life. So that's why it's important. It is estimated, and I don't know where to get this from. I just heard this, and I, I'm not saying this is fact. Estimated that most Christians spend three to five minutes a day praying. Think about that. Three to five minutes praying. I know that's not this church. I know that. Now what you do is think of the time you spent praying. How much time do you spend complaining in the 24 hour period? I'm guilty of that. I mean, compare how much time you spent complaining to others compared to how you spend time talking to God. Because we can waste a lot of time complaining, can't we? And that will, again, give you a clue as to where, uh, one reason why your life might be not getting better than it is. Last week we had a heart-to-heart. -heart. I spoke a lot about prayer, mostly about prayer, some about leadership. And my priority as a pastor to obey Jesus when he said, when he quoted scripture and said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Okay? And just like we did that every Wednesday night until God says otherwise. Last week I said until the rest of the year or whatever. But really it's until when God says, because when, when he says goes. Every Wednesday night until God says different, we're going to have a prayer service. And we're going to still be going to the Word of God also. 
We're going to come together to pray, okay? Um, start something new. I told you last week, those of you who weren't last week, something called Pastors Prayer Partners. And one of the things we're going to do this Saturday, we're going to meet, and all are welcome to a Bob Evans, like Tony said, for a prayer breakfast at 8 o'clock, okay, on Ritchie Highway in Pasadena. I will be opening up my home very shortly to have people in my home. I didn't say this last week, but this is something that I'm going to do maybe on a monthly basis or whatever it is. I'm going to try to do on a regular basis and have people over for prayer, uh, for the Word of God, for fellowship, and for food, just to come together, again, to make myself accessible to the church for prayer, okay? We have a sign-up sheet out there for those who are interested in praying a half an hour a day uh, to, to pray about specific prayer. We will... We're not just going to be praying. We're going to pray specifically. Okay? But when we get that list together, we'll start and give you guys what we're going to pray about. And God has laid on my house, laid on my heart, that we will be a house of prayer. We are going to be a house of prayer, church. We are going to make prayer a priority in this church. Okay? And James 5, you can turn your Bibles to James 5, 13 through 20, tells us about the power of prayer. My prayer is this scripture will encourage you in your prayer life to soar. I want, I want to see us soar to a whole new level. Like I said last week at Brooklyn Tabernacle, when they have a prayer service, two hours before it starts, people start pouring in because they want to pray. They want to come together in the presence of God to pray. How about this? Think about this, church. Every time, and I'm going to try to do this for myself, every time you're tempted to complain, how about let that be a cue that it's time to pray? How about that? We've been praying a lot longer. Some of us have been praying a lot. This scripture is very, it is much debated and very controversial over this scripture, um, especially certain sections of it. I'm going to, I'm going to briefly speak about it. But let's remember here what, that James is speaking, and he's writing this letter to suffering saints. We've seen that right at the beginning in, in James 1.1. He told us who he was writing the book to, to suffering saints that were dispersed. Remember, they were being persecuted, and they were having to flee. So this is for suffering saints, and this is the key to understanding this passage right here. Also the key to understanding the word sick in this scripture, because it's this word sick, uh, there's some beliefs, and we'll get into that a little later, but, but um, sometimes th this, this word is not just talking about the physically sick. Okay? Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I want us to um, prepare for God to really hit you hard today with this scripture. And I want it, I want it to really sink in because I think we, we desperately need the power of prayer in our lives. How many understand that prayer changes things? Yes, amen. Prayer changes things. And I want to thank you all, the whole entire church, and many of my other prayer partners out here. I have a lot of people that I pray with uh, for praying for my daughter, who's here today. I just want to praise God for her. Praise God for that. Uh, because without the power of prayer, she wouldn't be here. I know she wouldn't. She's got so many people praying for her. And I know you all, as a church, we've been doing this. So let, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity we have to, 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 to just get, tap into the, the awesome power of, of James as he speaks on this power of prayer. Lord, just help us to unpack this scripture and, and just present it in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, prepare us to receive your blessing, receive your message, and receive the power that comes through prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that our prayer life would today be the, today would be the beginning of a, of a new era in our walk with you in our prayer life, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we praise you for your scripture, for your word. We thank you for the health that you've given us today to be here today. Lord, we pray for those who can't be here because of, of health issues or work or whatever reason, Lord. We just pray that you just... Um, your presence be here today, Lord. Lord, we're, not, we're only here for you. We're here because you're here. And your power and your presence, Lord. So I pray that you anoint every single person in here with the power of your Holy Spirit. 
Lord, just lift us up. Lord, you know how heavy our hearts are. Some of you here today barely got here because we're so heavy. Our hearts are so heavy. We didn't even want to get out of bed, some of us. But we're here because we want to hear from you. So, Lord, speak to us, Lord. Lord, we're speaking to you now, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we praise you for who you are. We thank you for this awesome access to the throne of grace, Lord. We just give you the praise. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. I tell you, this scripture is so powerful. Um, so powerful. Let's start. Let's, let's start with the beginning here. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you suffering? Yes. Suffering can come in all kind of ways. You know, I, I'm, I'm praying for someone right now that's, that's got a son that has mental illness, and it's tearing her apart. Mental illness is something that, if you don't have never dealt with it, um, it, is, it is horrifying. But suffering is not just talking about sickness. It's talk, it can be emotional. It can be physical. Our circumstances can be so overwhelming. But is anyone among you suffering? <coughs> what does James tell us to do for those who are suffering? He didn't waste no time. He answered his own question. Let him pray. Let him pray. Not as a last resort, but the first. Let him pray. Church, we need to pray. God wants prayer to be a priority. Not something we do to hand off something or just a fill-in, but a priority. A priority in our life. And when you are in trouble, it should be a knee-jerk reaction. The first thing we think of is pray. Just, I just got, you know how you get thoughts? I just got a memory, and maybe some of you got one too, but I just got a memory. I was at a meeting, and I got a call. This is back when we were used to, used to allow to use our phones at work. I got a phone while, a call while I was, uh, and I looked at it, and it was, a, it was a call. This was about seven years ago, but I still remember. It just came to my mind. Those of you who are here, Raphael used to be a member of our church, but he was my boss at, at Toyota. Uh, he moved to... Uh, another state, but I got a call about my daughter that she had OD. And he, he, he came to me and said, what just happened? Because he noticed the first thing I did was lay my head down and start praying. And I just thought of that because he, that, that touched him. He told me that that was the first thing you did. He said, I would have been like jumping up and he said, but you prayed. That should be our first reaction to when something comes our way that we pray. That we pray. A question for you. Raise your hand. What is prayer? <coughs> no, Mark, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Communication with God. Amen. We don't have to go any further. Okay. Simply, it's, I'll, I'll just add one word to what you said. It's intimate conversation with God. That's all it is, church. It's speaking to God. And I just warned someone at my work, because I've been doing this a little more lately, and not doing it on purpose. But I just start talking to God out loud. I, and I, I said, if you hear somebody come to you say, Paul's losing, he's talking to himself a lot. Because I'll be in the office just talking to God. And sometimes, usually it's not out loud. Usually it's internally. But sometimes I just want to speak to God. Sometimes we're hurting so bad we want to speak to God. Sometimes we don't care if people hear us or not. I don't care. And I warned the guy and I told him, I said, you probably, but I really don't care. I don't care if people think I'm crazy because I've talked to God. Yes, I'm going to talk to God. And sometimes it's going to be verbally. Sometimes it's just going to yell out the name of Jesus. Sometimes that's all we can do, church, when we pray. Just yell out, Jesus. We just yell out his name. I remember when I was at the concert two weeks, a month ago, it's Jesus Culture. Man, I was screaming Jesus' name at the top of my lungs. I just felt like just screaming his name out because I was just, I was just, I knew he was right there and I just was just screaming his name out, Jesus. Sometimes that's what we need to do, church. That there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Power in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Far too many of us want to throw in the towel before we throw up our prayers to the throne of grace. Yeah. Don't we? We just want to throw the towel in. 
and say, forget this, I don't want it no more. Instead of taking the time to pray. Okay? To Jesus who loves us. We're not just praying, we're praying to someone that earnestly cares about me and you. What did we see in James earlier? That he, what's it say? Let me, let me, so I don't misquote it. Um, that, that, he, that he yearns for us. He yearns for you and me. He's jealous of you for you and me because he loves us so much. When you pray, you are gaining access to grace. Did you hear that, church? Yeah. When you pray, you are gaining access to grace. How many need grace today? So when you pray, you're gaining access to grace. We pray in order to get the grace of God. We need the grace of God. I need the grace of God to deal with the problems that we have. Let's look at Hebrews 4.16. I love this scripture. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence, we can confidently draw near to the throne of grace, that should be encouraging, church, that when we go to God, we can go confidently as we draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Church, there is nothing sweeter than receiving God's grace and His mercy in a time of need. Amen? Amen. Amen. Nothing. Nothing can, I don't care, you can't top that. You can't top receiving mercy and grace in your time of need. Amen? Amen? Look what Paul had to deal with. 2 Corinthians. I'm going to preach this one day. I had never preached this verse, these verses before, but I, I can't wait to do it one day when God lays in my heart to do it. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because <laughs> we all need a little dose of that, don't we? We all get conceited, don't we? So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. How many can relate? It's not specific what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It doesn't come out and specifically say we have all kind of uh, people to say it was his eyes, it was this, it was that. But we really don't know exactly what it was. But look at this. A messenger of Satan to harass me. How many understand that, that Job was harassed by Satan? That God allowed certain things to come Job's way. And it wasn't because of sin, church. Just because somebody's going through something bad, don't just come to the conclusion, oh, they must have a lot of sin going on in their life. Job did. And look what happened to him. To keep me from being conceited. Three times. Paul, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. Three times. Paul went fervently to the Lord to, to take this thorn away. And sometimes, sometimes we come more than three times. We come 50 times to plead with you, Lord, please take this away. How many have been there, done that? Please, Lord, I can't take it no more. Take this away. That it should leave me. Paul wanted it to leave him. So we don't want to go through this sometimes. Some of us have been going through the same thing, not for a week, not for a month, but for years. <coughs> Look at the response. What he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you and for me. His grace is sufficient, is bigger than any problem you have. His grace can help you. It might not take it away. But it can help you through the deepest, darkest times. Amen? Amen? My grace is sufficient for you for my power. For my power. How many want God's power? God's power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes when we're at our weakest points, we're at our strongest because we're relying on the Lord totally. So what happens? Therefore, Paul says, okay, is this the way it is? He played it three times. He knows it. God ain't taking this away. i got to live with this the rest of my life. This thorn in the flesh is not going nowhere. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, 
insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Church, that's the truth right there. When you are at your weakest time, how many, how many know that prayer of the footprints when you carries you through? Well, yeah. There's a lot of times there's only one set of footprints going on. And maybe that's you today. That you're actually, God is actually, if you were walking on the sand in the beach right now, there would only be one set of footprints. That would be God carrying you because you are out of strength. You are out of power. There's nothing left. But guess what, church? i got good news for you. My grace, His grace, is sufficient for you and for me. And, and His grace is sufficient. Some of us here today, possibly, are mad at God. We're mad at God because of what's going on in our lives, and we don't understand it. And I'll tell you this. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and he, what will He do? He shall direct your paths. Amen? Amen. Amen? Because He hasn't got rid of your thorns, you still got that thorn going on. you still got that thorn that will not go away. And you're probably thinking... I'm going to probably have to live the rest of my life with this thorn. Well, guess what? Rely on His grace and trust in Him to deal with it. Okay? Look at the, look at the rest of verse uh, 13 here. Is anyone cheerful? Anyone cheerful today? Yeah. That was good. That was good cheerful. <laughs> Let him sing praise. All right, let's sing some praise. Come on. Sing some praise. Hallelujah. Sing some praise today. If things are going smooth and well right now, praise them. Praise them. Give them praise because it ain't going to be like that all the time. Praise them. Whether you're praying or you're praising, you're in contact with God all the time. That's the point, church. All the time. Praising, praying, always in contact with God. If you're having a bad day, pray. If you're having a good day, praise Him. Either way, you're talking to God all day long. All day long. He should be, you should be communicating with God more words than any other person around. You should be constantly in a constant state of praying. If prayer is this important, why is it we don't pray or we use it as a last resort? Why is it that? If it's that important, how many of you here today believe you need to pray more. Wow. Almost everybody. Do you want to pray more? Then what's the problem? I'm going to tell you what the problem is. I know what the problem is. Because I, I deal with this and, and you do it. You know what the problem is? We don't plan to pray. We don't plan. You've got to plan to pray. All right, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how important it is. How many like going on vacation? Okay? Never been. Do you plan your vacation? Do you plan your vacation or do you just wake up? Okay, my vacation, I put, I put in mine in February. Okay, June 1st, my vacation. Alright, I'm just going to wake up June 1st and go and just, just wing it. Just whatever, whatever, whatever. No, we don't do that. We take time. I know I do. I take time to plan it. I, I'm, a, I'm a planner. When it comes to vacation, I want everything to be just right. I want to make sure I got uh, water. I want to make sure I got everything. Gas, I'm gassed up. I like to get old chains. I like to get when I'm traveling. I like to uh, have everything just right, just ready to go. Okay? So why aren't we doing that plan to pray? What is more important? A trip, which is important, a vacation. It's an earthly vacation. We all need it. Or a divine appointment to heaven. Think about it. A divine appointment. But which one? But you see what? Satan does not want you and I praying as a lifestyle. He doesn't want, he, he don't mind the quickie prayers. Oh, God is good, God is great. Let's thank you for the food. And say hello. Okay. okay. And what's that one? Uh, lay down, go to sleep, and I'll fuss all the You ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Satan loves, them prayers ain't doing nothing. We got fervent prayer. I didn't even tell my wife this, but I, so she probably, But anyway, yesterday I, I, I was uh, by a park, and I just decided I, I wanted to go in this park that has water and stuff, and I went there just to pray. I, I just felt led to do that. Um, but 
Satan doesn't want us to have a lifestyle of prayer where you have intimate communication with God. He doesn't want that. He'll do. He'll keep you so busy, so busy that you 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 ain't. I ain't got time to pray. I ain't got time to pray. No, you need to take time to pray. We need to plan. Okay. So what is your prayer plan? That's why we're. What some of the things I'm doing is scheduling prayer, scheduling times of prayer, a prayer breakfast uh, over my house for prayer. Uh, just uh, 9.30 in the morning here, uh, praying, come together to pray before church. We, that's the first thing we do here is pray at 9.30. If you need prayer, if your week has just been bottoms down and you've got nowhere to go, come on in my office at 9.30 and I will lift you up and Mark will lift you up and we will pray together. All right? If you need prayer, if, if, come. 9.30, you're all invited. My, we're going we're gonna to get a prayer room upstairs. Right now I can only fit about four or five in there, but we'll, I'll jam you in there. We'll, 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 we'll find a way. But we're going to pray for each other. Prayer must be prioritized, especially in times of trials. Especially in times of trials when, when the bottom drops out, when you don't even know what to pray about. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Look at... Look at uh, Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? And here we go. We have to first deal with this word sick. Because, and some of you are going to disagree with me on this, and that's okay. I have brothers and sisters. We love each other. We disagree on some doctrine, the Bible. But that's okay. Uh, we still meet every week at church at, at the church of Toyota. And this is one of the verses that we have controversy over. Is this word sick? Is anyone among you sick? The Greek word means weak, okay? It can refer to any kind of weakness. It's not just physically sick, okay? This is also an affliction that is beating you down. How many have been beaten down before? I mean, sometimes you just get beaten down. Your circumstances are beating you down. This is what we're talking about here, and it's weakening you, okay? He is saying that if the suffering of verse 13 is weakening you in verse 14, then you're going to need help, support. Sometimes we got a lot of pride, church. If you're weak, James says, look, look, look right here. Here's what he tells you if anyone's going to be sick. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Okay. Sometimes. We are too weak to pray. We even get too weak to pray. We just lose heart. We, we get too weak. I talked about leadership some, and one of my areas of failure as a, as a pastor, as a leader, is not holding leaders accountable. I, I, have, done, I have failed in that area. I've, I've been looking at things, and I have let things get me. Uh, sometimes just let leaders just do their own thing. And that's my fault for not being more accountable. But as leaders, one of the things we need to do as leaders is to be on call for the church for prayer. As leaders of the church, we need to be on call for the church to pray for you. Who are you calling right now when you're weak and you need prayer? Okay? Do you feel that you have the confidence in your church leaders to call on us to come to you to pray? Because I can tell you this, one of the things that we as leaders need to do Sometimes we're going to have to drop what we're doing and come to you to pray for you. Sometimes we're going to have to do that. Okay? The text says when you are weak, you are to call on the leadership of the church and they are to pray over you. Okay? That is because the praying you could do in verse 13, you can't do in verse 14. You need help. Okay? In verse 13, you are doing the praying. In verse 14, you're calling to help because instead of getting stronger in your prayers, you're getting weaker. Your prayers ain't working. You're getting weaker. So you need to call the leadership of the church for us to pray over you and lift you up. Don't be too proud to not call on your church leaders. And I just gave you an invitation at 930. Please, come. The leaders will be there to pray for you. Okay? And look at this. Here's another thing right here. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
The Greek word for oil here is common day rubbing oil to refresh a person. Okay? I've had prayer healing services here before, and I've used anointing oil. I just want to tell you this. That oil does not heal nobody. It's not the oil that's doing the healing. If you call on me to anoint you with oil, I'll do it. But I can just, and it is a symbol. It's symbolism. Even David, remember David said, you have anointed my head with oil. Did, did God literally pour oil on his head? You know, I'm talking about, there, there's, I know they have done it with anointing, but sometimes it's figuratively and symbolically spoken. It's not, I'm just saying that sometimes, don't think that the oil is the magic oil. Like you can get this oil from over in uh, Israel or something that it's going to have magic and will heal you. Uh, like these, uh, some of these pastors on church, on TV, that say, uh, order this uh, healing handkerchief or something. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, okay. But no, you call on the elders of the church. Okay? Call on the leadership of the church. If, if you want me to anoint you, I will do it. I will do it. If, that, if it means something to you, I will do it. But I don't have to do that. I don't think they walked around with, with anointing oil and did, you know, everybody, every, you know, I don't have to feel like i got to have anointing oil or I can't pray over you. No, but I will do it if you need it, okay? What it is, that oil is a symbol of encouragement. It's a symbol of encouragement. And that's what prayer does. I can still remember right here when we prayed for Susan, who has went on to be with the Lord. But she did get healed of her cancer. And she, I never met her before when she came here to that service. Some of you were here. I know Tony was here, and I don't know who else was here. Mark was here, I'm sure. Lynette, you were here. But we prayed for her. And I just want to tell you this. Something happened that night, that, that night, because it was a night service. I felt so much power in my prayer when I was laying hands on her. I, I, and I told her this. I have never felt that kind of power coming from me just to her. The, 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 it was something, it was God. I could just feel it. Amen. It wasn't the oil, it was God that just using me, using and using us as a church to pray to this woman. And she had faith. She came here weak as you don't know what. And, and wasn't, didn't think ever she was going to make it. Yes, she did get healed. Yes, eventually she did die. Because I'm telling you, church, this sick here is not just speaking of that, or we would never die. If I could, if we, if every time we prayed for you because you were sick, you would be healed. It, it doesn't always work, and we're going to get a little deeper than that a little bit. But for those who have been beaten down, use this opportunity to come for prayer so we can hold your hold your hands up. Remember Moses. Remember, sometimes we need our hands held up. Sometimes we need help. And I know one time my pastor before me, he had me come up and another guy come up, and he, here's what he told me to do: just stand here and hold your hands up. So the whole time he preached, I just held my hands up. And guess what? My hands were getting tired. After about 20, 30, 40, he preached a lot longer than I do. He used to go to a quarter to one. I remember. Sometimes almost to one o'clock. So you guys don't. So I'm just telling you, man, I was getting weary. My hands were getting, I mean, our arms were getting, I mean, I needed help. Sometimes our arms, we're, we need help. We need someone to come up and hold us, hold our hands, and hold our hands up. Amen? Amen. So church, who are you calling on when you are weak? Jesus. Who are you, call, who are you going to call on? Jesus. The church, the leadership. I hope you got that. The text says when you are weak to call the leadership of the church and they will pray for you. So do that church, do it. Use us. We're leaders. We need to be used by you. Okay? This is because the praying you could not do in verse 13, you could do in 13, you can't do in 14. So, James 14, let's, go, let's finish it up here. Or let's go to James, actually, James 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. We see here the promise of prayer here. This is, here, here's the reason that this is not only speaking of physical sickness. Again, nobody would die, right? I mean, if, it's just not speaking of that. And it can be sick, it can be healed, and you can be healed, yes. But the scripture sometimes is the Lord's will for sickness. Remember the blind man who was blind through, through birth. You know, they, 
they, they want to claim that it was a sin, because it, uh, but the Pharisees were, were, were big on this, that they would say uh, that, you know, if there's affliction in you, it must be because of sin, right? But sometimes it's just for someone to see a miracle of God and the glory of God, amen? Sometimes it's to see, sometimes he does it so we can see something that we never seen before. That's something only God could do. Sometimes we need to see that. We need to see God. The promise here is that the one who prays in faith will pick up the weary. God's not necessarily saying he'll give you the solution to your problem, but what he what you will get is divine encouragement. Divine encouragement in the midst of the problem. Sometimes that's all we need, church, is a little encouragement to help us through the storms. Amen? Just a little encouragement goes a long way sometimes, doesn't it? When we really need it. The church can't solve all your problems. I'm not trying to say we can solve all your problems, because we can't. We can't fix everything. But we can help you, encourage you in prayer. Amen? Amen. The key here is the prayer of faith. And what is the prayer of faith? Well, the Bible gives us a definition of it in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Listen to this. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything, anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. Go back to 14, please. Look at this, church. Confidence. When you pray, I pray with some people. I, I've been doing this a lot more recently. I, I pray with when two or more gather together. I pray in agreement. Us two are in agreement that we're going to pray because we know this is the will of God. We know this is the will of God. So we're going to pray in agreement. And I've watched this and I've seen this powerfully happen in people's lives. It just happened to a, a friend of mine at work. That we, we, I, prayed, I laid hands on her and prayed and we prayed in agreement. The God, we know this is your will, God. We know it's your will. Do something. Help. Guess what? God did something miraculous. He come back to me like two days later and said, you ain't going to believe this. The prayer that we prayed, God did it. And God, in two days, it could be one day, it could be one minute, it could be, it could be five years. I don't know. God, God's time, a thousand years, a day to, it was a thousand years to us. So this time, we ain't on the same thing. It just happened in two days. was was, was amazing that he did that. <coughs> Look, okay, church, I'm going to ask you a question. This is a, this is a pretty easy question. That I think even a child would give me the right answer. Is it the will of God for you to be miserable? No. 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 Okay. What's it say in James 1, 2? When we first started this three, four months ago, listen to this. James, James starts off right here. After he tells you who he's writing to, he tells you this, because this is, this is big. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, because you will meet them, various trials, meet trials of various kinds. Okay, church? So, we're supposed to meet our trials with joy. Count it all joy, not so, all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials, how in the world can we count these as joy, our, our, our big problem? You know why? Because we have an expected part that God is doing something. Because we believe the promise that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Amen? Yeah. We believe that. Do you believe that? Yes. Then no matter what you're going through, God is working for the good. So you can have joy in the fact, not of... Not the bad circumstances. Join the fact that my God is working this out for my good because he loves me. Well, you have such a promise in you. Okay? Suppose your faith is too weak. What do you do, church? What do you do if your church if your faith is too weak? I'm going to ask you again. Call on the elders of the church. Thank you. Why? Because we piggy you get on our backs and we carry you. We piggyback you. And there's a great story in Mark 2, 1 through 7. Great story that, that, that talks about this. So look, listen to this. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. 
and he was preaching the word to them. This is Jesus. We're talking about, man, Jesus had the place full. There was no, imagine that. Then we, today, I would just imagine that we got so full today, they were at the doors on the sides. I mean, they were just couldn't even get in. Of course, I'm not Jesus, so they're not coming. But if Jesus was here, I bet you that's what that would be. Because we want to see Jesus, yes. And they came, bring to him a paralytic carried by four men. I'm starting to get the picture, church? Did you hear what I just said? And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Okay? And when Jesus saw, this is a key church, when Jesus saw, whose faith? Their faith. Yeah. Their faith. Five of them. He's seen all five of their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is a blasphemer who can forgive sins but God alone. Okay, the point here is, Jesus didn't see the sick man's faith. He see their faith. He, when, when you come to the leaders of the church, you not only see, God not only sees their faith, He sees your faith because you have made a commitment to piggyback, to, to come on my back, come on my back, you're too weak to pray, I'm going to pray for you. Guess what, church? One day that's going to be you. One day that's going to be me. One day I'm going to be too weak to come to Jesus. I'm going to need help, just like one day you are. We're going to need each other, so we piggyback on each other. The sick man said, I can't get to Jesus. Will you guys come over here? And help me get to Jesus. I can't get through. I can't do this. I need help. These men had enough faith that if they got the sick man to Jesus, he could help them. And they went to some extreme measures. I hope nobody comes to the roof. Uh, but they were, that's what they were coming from. They were, they were, they were bound. And they, they, were, they had faith that if they could get that man to Jesus, he was going to heal them. Amen? Amen? One day, church, it's going to be you and me. All right, let's look at the rest of this in uh, 15. Uh, let's see where, where, we, where we stop that here. I'm going to move my Bible around. Okay, back to 15. Okay, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, if he committed sins, he will be forgiven. I'm not saying that all sin lead is because of your sickness. If he can. Now, the sinner, if you are willing to deal with the lifestyle, the lifestyle of sin, God will forgive you of your sins. But if you are not willing to deal with your lifestyle, don't waste your time calling the leaders of the church. Because if you're not serious about it, God's not serious about it, church. If you're just going through the motions, don't waste your time. It's going to work. You've got to get serious. Say, repent and turn. Amen? Amen? Because not even me and the leaders of the church can help you if you're not going to deal with your lifestyle of sin. Okay. And also, you can expect to be weary if you're living a lifestyle of sin. Okay? If you're not dealing with it. Okay? So what does this mean if God will meet you in your struggles and God may or may not bring that struggle to an end depending on the will of God? That's what we're praying, church, for the will of God. Because God's will may be for my thorn. Man, I got some thorns. I got several thorns that have been sticking in me for a long time. And guess what? I guess God's telling me my grace is sufficient because it ain't going nowhere. It sure don't look like it's changed. I know some of you can relate to what I'm saying. So what am I going to do? Am I going to trust that His grace is sufficient? Or am I going to do my own thing and, and try to come up with some ingenious idea that is going to divert from my thorn and, and take it out myself? One of the things God will do, He will change you. He will change your attitude in the midst of the storm. Just like that woman Susan I was talking about. Woman that had cancer, went through a lot. Man, her attitude, I seen her right before she passed away. I gave her a big hug in the store. She was sick, she was weak. I could see it. But you know what? 
she had a great attitude. She was still talking about being a witness for Jesus Christ when she goes to the cancer treatment. She's still talking about how she tries to help other patients that are dealing with what she's going through. She kept that positive attitude that she was not going to let this destroy her. Her attitude. You have control of your attitude. Not your circumstance, but your attitude in the circumstance. Amen? Amen. And peace. We all want peace. Peace is when the storms of life are roaring all around you, and you still have a peace. You still have a peace amidst all the, the troubles and the storms of life. You can have a peace with God. Amen? Sometimes God lets negative things happen so He can show you how powerful He really is. Because sometimes I know I go to God and I pray, God, nobody can help me here, only you. This is only you can do this. And, and we got to trust that and he, sometimes he wants to show us something new. All right, let's get into uh, 16. It's getting late. I'm sorry. I could have. Uh, just get excited about prayer. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Okay. Now James goes from the leadership to the fellowship to one another. He's talking to the church. See, you thought just the leaders were up. You thought just us, the leaders were up. No, we're all held accountable here. You ain't off the hook. One another. Thank you. Fellowship. One another. Now he says, okay, what's it say? Where are we at? 16. 16. Therefore, confess it to one another. One another. Confess your sins to one another. Not saying to pray to, to let your dirty laundry out. We're not asking that, but, so, you know, I went to a brother. I got a brother I can go to. I went to him with something. I, he's the only one I've told this to, that I, I asked him for prayer for something. But, you know, I'm thankful I can go to him. And, and sometimes we just need that one another. We need that person that we can trust that ain't going to blab it all over, the, all over the state. You know, that we can go to and, and we can tell them how we're hurt, how our hearts are hurt and what we're going through. And he's not going to, they're not going to judge us. And, and, and they're still going to, we know, I know he still loves me. When I went to him, I knew when I walked away that I wasn't going to be, uh, man, he told me, Paul, Anytime, text, call, you need me, I'm there for you. That's the way he respond. Not like, man, man, get away from me. You know, uh, I got my own problems. You know, I don't need your problem too. You know, sometimes we got that kind of attitude. Like, I got my own problems. I, the world does it. I don't want to hear your problem. I got my own problems. Okay. Now James moves from the leadership to the fellowship, and this is also. Talking about small groups. Small groups are so valuable. And that's one of the areas, another dream I have. I have so many dreams that, I mean, I, I'm a dreamer. I have a lot of dreams. One of my dreams is, is on discipleship and on small groups and having small group home Bible studies. And I'm going to be talking to somebody this week about that. But this is where, this is really important, where you get in a small group and you can share what's going on in your life. And you can share with others that are not going to be judgmental. Uh, this week we had prayer. We, we had the women come up here and the men go back there. Uh, and, the, and the women, man, like they told me, they need tissue up here next time because they were crying and uh, they, were, they were really, I mean, I, I could see they were getting into the prayer up here. That was awesome, you know, that they come together and uh, pray together. We need that, church. One another. We need one another to pray for each other. And the men, what we did was we, we shared one thing in our lives that we need to pray for. Can you pray for me this week on this matter? And, and, and this is what we, what we try to do. So, why should we pray for one another? Why should we do that? Well, James tells us. You don't even have to answer me because he answers it for you. Uh, here it is. That you may be healed. That you may be healed because the prayer of a righteous person or man or woman, whatever you want to say, has great power as it is working. A fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful. Okay? It's powerful, is it not? It's, this is called energized prayer, church. This is what I call earnest prayer when I still think of Jesus with them great drops of blood. I'm sweating right now, but they ain't, I ain't got the intensity where if you see blood starting to come down, that means that mean, that mean he was intense. Earnestly praying, Lord. Sometimes we got to get energized in our prayers and get serious, and, and not just throw up these little quickies. And quickies are okay in some cases, but 
we're going to get a little deeper. A little. What time is it? We, we might have to move this. No, we're going to go on. James gives us an illustration here. Let, let's go to 17, 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. Listen to this, church. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again. He prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Okay? So what are you saying? Okay. Elijah prayed. What an amazing prayer he prayed that God answered. Well, guess what? Elijah was an ordinary man just like you and like me. When you pray, your prayers go to the throne of grace. And when God sends his, his response down to heaven, he can open up the heavens, he can close, he can do anything. He can take that prayer from an ordinary man like Elijah and like you and me, and he can do miraculous things. But if you don't pray, you can't do nothing. Amen. So you've got to pray. Amen? Amen. Amen? He prayed earnestly. He got serious. Are you serious about prayer? Amen. Yes. yes. Are you serious about prayer? Yes. I'll find out Wednesday night if you're here or not. <laughs> Saying it's one thing, doing it's another. Love is an action word. But here's how Elijah prayed. We, we, we can't leave him on this note. He prayed biblically. Okay? And I'm not going to go through all the scripture. We ain't got time. But there's scripture to prove that. He prayed specifically. Listen, to that's specific prayer. He prayed specifically. None of these, I pray for all the world, that all the world be healed and uh, do better. Well, great. You, didn't, you just didn't say nothing. You just said nothing again. Specific. He prayed humbly. In one case, he talks about prayer sticking his, his head between his legs. Praying praying in a, in a humble posture. He prayed humbly. He prayed persistently. One time he prayed seven times. Seven times. He kept on praying. He, he prayed expectantly, expecting God to, to, to answer. And God answers in three ways. Yes, no, slow. Okay? We don't like the slow. Peter asked Jesus to walk on water. Remember that? Peter asked Jesus to walk on water. Jesus said, what did he say? Come on. Come on. And what did Jesus do? He walked on water. But then he looked at the storm. This is what we do. We take our eyes off of Jesus. We look over at the storm and we sink. We sink because our eyes are off of Jesus and on the storm. As soon as you take your eyes off of Jesus, you're done. You're done. Your, your circumstances will drown you. You will sink. What happened when Peter started sinking? He cried out. What did Jesus do? Immediately. Grab Save him. That's what our Jesus does. Amen. When we pray to him. Amen? Amen. If you're sinking, if you're growing weary, you're looking in the wrong place. You ain't looking at Jesus. Because if you keep your eyes on Jesus, keep your eyes <coughs> fixed on Jesus. Church, the cross. Every day, you got to return to the cross. And look at what he's done to you. You think your pain was something? Just read about the accounts of the pain that Jesus went through on the cross for you and me because he loved you. That's pain. He went through some stuff that you'll never, you and I will never experience. And he did it. Okay? Stop looking at your circumstances. Stop complaining. And let's look up to the one, to the only one, who can make a difference and can change you. Amen. Raise your head up. Get someone to help you if you need help. Don't keep drowning. Don't keep sinking. Get some help. Come 9.30 in the morning. Come after this service. You're going to have a chance to know today. Don't ever let go until you hear Jesus. Don't listen to everything around you. Don't listen to the world around you. Listen to Jesus. Sometimes you're going to have to be still and hear that small, still voice because there's a lot of, a lot of noise all around us saying, saying a lot of things. And sometimes we listen to that. We listen to what people are saying instead of holding on to Jesus. 
Hold on to Jesus. I'm going to read these last two verses, and then we're going to do something here. My brothers, if any of you among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Returning the backslide. There ain't one person in this church that hasn't backslid, including your pastor. Ain't one of you lived a per perfect picture life. Sorry. We've all backslid. We've all come to a point where we need to come back to Jesus. You may be there today. Well, guess what? If you need to come back to Jesus, the band can come up. In case you got to fly with everything. <laughs> Give me on prayer and forget. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do, church. You said you're serious about prayer. Okay. I want, I'm not going to do the invitation like we usually do it. I'm not going to stand up here and pray for you today. If you need prayer with me or Mark or someone, one of the other leaders, we're here for you after the service. Today I got something bigger than that. I want us to all, if you need to come to the throne. Last week we all came up and did the Lord's Supper. I think that was last week. Yeah. We came up together. Now I'm asking you this week. I know the, the uh, altar's not that big and you can come anywhere, but I want you to come and humble yourself before God as they're singing, playing this song, and cry out to Jesus and help Him to restore your broken heart. And, and to heal your circumstances and, and to help you with that thorn in the flesh that, that's, that's, that's sticking you. And maybe you just need to cry out for His grace. Like, you just need more grace, more mercy. That's one prayer that you can guarantee Jesus will give you. you cry out for more grace, He will give it to you. He will give it to you. So I want you to come. You can come now. I want you to come to the throne. Not for me, but for Jesus. Don't let... Don't... Sometimes you've got to get out of your comfort zone. If you can't stand up for Jesus, everybody stand up anyway because we're going to worship God. Stand up for Jesus. He's waiting at the throne. He's got a 1-800 number. And, he, and you can call him at any time. I, I think now is a good time to collectively come to him and call on the one who can help you, who can bring healing, and can forgive you of your sins. Some of us need to just come for the fact that I need forgiveness. Tell you this, I told you last week, every morning I wake up, that's one of the first things I do is pray for forgiveness. I want to start fresh with my, my Savior. I want to be clean. I want to be washed in the blood of Jesus.